There are many old Japanese folk tales that start out something like this. The old man went out into the mountains to gather firewood, while the old woman went to the river to wash clothes. Throughout history, roles between the sexes have always been well defined. The men work outside of the house, while the women stay inside and do the housework. These roles still linger on, even today. Men are strong and women are weak. Men are superior while women are inferior. Laws, systems, education, marriage, family planning, in short, every aspect of life is dominated by men and the male way of thinking. Now, however, conditions have changed considerably. Women are waking up to an awareness of their own capabilities and intellect and are involving themselves in a diverse array of activities with the goal of achieving equality. We are seeing a rising tide of such an awakening in Asia and around the world. Asian women are now emancipating themselves from poverty and are greatly expanding their activities with the purpose of gaining economic and social independence. What capabilities then do we women need in order to be able to overcome poverty and stand on our own two feet both economically and socially? There are six issues that come to mind that we must address. First, there are the concepts embodied in traditional value systems. We need to examine these once again from our point of view as women. In Japan, it was said in the past that boys and girls must not be brought up together after the age of seven, and they consequently receive their education separated from one another beginning in primary school. Women were also denied the right to participate in public functions. With the enactment of the new constitution and civil code in 1945, however, equality between the sexes was guaranteed. Furthermore, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was ratified in 1985. And in order to make this a reality, various laws and systems were introduced and the subjugation of women that had been prevalent until then gradually began to fade away. Surveys conducted by Sagami Hara City in Kanagawa Prefecture have shown a steady annual increase in the number of both men and women who do not accept the concept that men work and women stay at home. In their views on marriage, there has been an increase in the percentage of women who do not hold with the traditional view that marriage represents the road to happiness. This trend continues to gain strength throughout Japan. Even in China, a socialist nation professing the basic principle of equality between the sexes, the Confucian value system still remains deeply rooted among many women who would prefer a son when a child is born. Most women in Nepal look forward to the birth of a son because traditionally, in Nepalese culture, the son holds the right of inheritance. He also assumes responsibility for the care of his elderly parents arranging funerals and looking after other family matters. Most of the population of Pakistan are Muslims and the teachings of the Quran represent another traditional value system. Discrimination against women remains especially strong in agricultural areas where married women are afforded few opportunities for employment. In India, the ancient traditional value systems and customs are deeply rooted. This is evidenced, for example, in the never-ending acts of violence against women of low caste or members of poverty-stricken minorities. The Women's Liberation Journal, Manushi, reports on such acts of violence while continuing its call for the liberation of women. The government is also endeavoring to further human rights and equality for women and is promoting improvements through campaigns on the radio, TV, in movies, and in other media. 
It is necessary for each of us as women to seek a re-examination of these traditional value systems in our own countries. The second issue that will promote self-reliance among women is the eradication of prostitution. There was a time even in the history of Japan when women were commonly bought and sold as a result of poverty. Virtually all cities had their districts where houses of prostitution, known as yukaku, lined the streets. And there were even officially recognized licensed prostitutes. Grassroots women's organizations and women members of the national diet in Japan put up a persistent battle in order to abolish the system of licensed prostitution. As a result, the anti-prostitution law was finally enacted in 1958, which led to the abolishment of the system. There are still many women in other Asian countries who are forced into prostitution because of poverty. In the Philippines, prostitution became a social problem during the latter half of the 1970s. Not only that, their sex partners were foreign tourists. Beginning in the 1980s, women started an opposition movement to the so-called sex tours, which led to a rapid drop in the number of tourists from overseas who were attracted to prostitution. About 65% of the total population of Indonesia live in farming villages. Life is still impoverished in these villages and there are many women who leave for the cities and support themselves through prostitution. Young girls in Nepal who are unable to endure the hardships of life in the farming villages and go into the cities are deceived by prostitution agents and are sold overseas. According to surveys of the Ministry of Health in Nepal, their numbers reach as high as 50,000. In northern and northeastern Thailand, girls of 12 and 13 are sold into prostitution. It is said that there are as many as 1 million prostitutes in Thailand and that 70% of them are mere girls under the age of 15. National Assembly member Ms. Ladawang Wang Shri Wang, representing Payao constituency in northern Thailand, is currently involved in an aggressive drive to eliminate prostitution among young girls while continuing vigorous efforts to promote self-reliance. She is also working to strengthen the existing anti-prostitution law. The third issue that will promote independence among women is the encouragement and fulfillment of education. Through education, women can acquire knowledge and technology, become aware of information that is accurate, and promote their own economic independence. Primary education for women began in Japan in 1872, which for Asia was comparatively early. As a national policy, primary schools were built everywhere throughout the nation, even in the most remote rural villages. After 1945, education became compulsory for middle school students through the age of 15. Overall, 90% of all students continued on to high school in 1994, with women surpassing men with a rate of 96.8%. Furthermore, women and men ranked equally in their continuation on to higher education in universities and junior colleges in 1989, and by 1994 had excelled with a percentage of 45.9% in comparison with 40.9% for men. It can be said the economic development of Japan has been supported largely by the high level of education acquired by women and their advancement in society. This point is demonstrated in the disparity in the rate of illiteracy between men and women in the major nations of Asia. Even today in South Asia, there are some countries where 60 or even 70 percent or more of women can neither read nor write. The literacy rate among women in Nepal is 25 percent and, in addition, there are many women who drop out of primary school. Nepalese women get married at a young age and, once they are married, they are kept busy with their housework and become increasingly more alienated from opportunities to learn. 
Ms. Meneka Rajibandari, an activist in Nepal, is involved in continuing efforts to provide poor women in mountain villages with the opportunity to learn, even after marriage, by teaching them how to read at night. The literacy rate among women in Bangladesh is no more than a mere 19.2 percent. The government there is endeavoring to improve the literacy rate among women by providing female students in agricultural areas with textbooks free of charge and covering their tuition expenses. The fourth issue furthering the independence of women is reproductive health and rights. The Program of Action on Reproductive Health and Rights, which was approved at the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo in 1994, was an epoch-making decision that gives us women the right to decide for ourselves how many children we want and when we want to give birth. A half a century ago, Japan too was an impoverished nation with a high rate of both births and deaths. Women were urged to bear as many children as possible, especially during the war, as part of a national population policy. However, the Eugenic Protection Law was enacted in 1948 to guarantee the health of mothers and children. Furthermore, the New Life Movement, which began during the 1950s, brought about a decline in infant mortality through the dissemination of health education, hygiene and family planning, especially in farming villages. There ensued a rapid decline in the previous trend towards high birth and death rates. In addition, there has been a major change in the feeling toward marriage and family resulting from the increased rate of attainment of higher education and advanced degrees, as well as women's entrance into the labor force. This has resulted in a decrease in both the birth rate and the death rate and the trend toward fewer births and fewer deaths has now become established. It was said that the demographic transition from high to low birth and death rates could only happen in European countries and the USA. Japan, however, is the first nation in Asia where this has occurred. This proves that this demographic transition can also happen elsewhere in Asia. Today there are women who do not marry at all and also women who decide on their own when they want to get married according to their own convenience. There has also been an increase of women who decide to bear no children even after they are married and the total fertility rate has dropped to as low as 1.5. In response to the concern of men and the government that this trend toward a decline in population would be linked to a decline in industrial activity, the claim that women have the right to make their own decisions about birth has become stronger. There has also been growing opposition to the population policy in China, which provides sterilization operations to women only, even though such operations are easier for men and have little effect on their health. A major change is also taking place in the awareness of women themselves. A surge has been reported in divorce rates resulting from emotional incompatibility between husbands and wives due to the reform and liberation policies of the 1980s. In Singapore, there has been a progressive increase in late marriages as well as a lack of interest in marriage among those who have acquired higher education. Claiming that the decrease of children of women with a high IQ, that is, a high intelligence quotient, represents a loss to the nation the government of Singapore has gone so far as to adopt incentive measures to encourage marriage. Even though guidance in family planning and health education is provided in the farming villages of Nepal, especially by the mothers' clubs, family planning has only had a 23% implementation rate. Though women would prefer to have a reprieve from pregnancy after giving birth, here again there is no cooperation from men in using contraception and only women are making the effort. Miss Marta Sharma, a midwife in Kathmandu, has been making efforts to encourage and comfort poor farming women such as these and continues to provide health education and welfare support to them. The enthusiastic support of the developed nations of Asia is also necessary. 
The fifth issue in the goal of self-reliance is the promotion of economic independence through work. It is already evident in the various countries of Asia that many women have been expanding into activities within their own regions to achieve this goal. Rapid industrialization in Japan during the 1960s resulted in a dramatic increase in employment opportunities for women. However, the work mainly tended to be monotonous factory jobs or jobs that supplemented the work of men. The advent of the 1970s saw the development of the financial, service, information and other industries and employment opportunities for women expanded even further. With the enactment of the Equal Employment Opportunity Law in 1986, sexual discrimination in employment was prohibited. This opened to women jobs in planning, research, development, information and other intellectually oriented fields and there was an increase in women seeking careers. This does not mean, though, that equality in the true sense of the term has actually been achieved. Women's average salaries are still only about 60% of those of men, and in actuality, both housework and childcare still remain largely the responsibility of women. In China, since the Socialist Revolution, equality between men and women in both jobs and pay has been realized. The opinions of women are respected and there is no discrimination. Since the economy has undergone reform and liberalization, the industriousness of women has been remarkable. The strength of women has been even more highly praised in agricultural areas. Currently, one-third of local town and village operated enterprises are managed by women. In the cities, in such fields as finance, insurance, real estate and scientific technology, women specialists have exceeded male. In Indonesia, the number of working women has increased yearly. And in the cities, there has been a recent annual increase in the range of 8 to 9 percent. Through the steady growth of industry, there has been a broad expansion in employment opportunities. The path toward women's self-reliance has become more easily traversed. However, still only 30 percent of women are working in the formal sector, while the remaining 70 percent are self-employed or involved in cottage industries, agriculture or other labor. Nepal has a population of approximately 20 million, 90% of whom live in farming villages. In these villages, the women rise with the sun to gather firewood and draw water and are kept busy with various other household tasks. After that, they are also expected to work in the fields. Bearing a child almost every year and unable to endure such tough working conditions, their lives frequently end in the tragedy of suicide. There are virtually no farming women who can read or write, and, regardless of how hard their labors in the village may be, they have no way of leaving. In India, the new economic policy was initiated in the 1990s, and the employment opportunities for women have increased. Many women have taken up jobs in particular in electronics, electrical equipment, watch manufacturing, computers, printing, and other industries. The population of women in India currently stands at about 470 million. In order to continue to increase female employment, vocational training programs are being implemented not only in industry, but also in agriculture, fisheries, crafts, and other fields. In the city of Madras in Tamil Nadu state, women have instituted the Working Women's Forum and, based on this, they are moving ahead with activities aiming for economic independence. In groups of 10 or 20, they pool their annual dues of 12 rupees each and use that cash to buy vegetables to sell for themselves. Their aim is for self-reliance by taking whatever is not sold and selling it in the afternoon in the form of processed products. In many areas throughout Asia, women's groups such as these are now becoming focal points. 
They are making it possible for women to gain a strong sense of self-confidence in their ability to change themselves and their lives. The sixth issue that will lead women to self-reliance is participation in the government policy decision-making process. In almost all countries, women still have little or no power in government. This indicates the ratio of women National Assembly members in the countries of Asia. In the House of Representatives of the Diet in Japan, women account for a mere 2.7 of the total, while in the House of Councillors they hold 13.5% of the seats, for an average total of 6.3%. The National People's Congress is the legislative body in China. Women make up 21% of the total, which is the highest representation by women in any legislative body in Asia. Even so, they still do not account for even one-fourth of the number of men. Only nine seats, or 5% of the total 180 available in the lower house in the federal government of Malaysia, are occupied by women. Women make up half of the population, therefore, we women must make sure that our opinions are reflected in the national assemblies by occupying at least half of the seats. In India, in both the national assembly and the state councils, women consist of only a total of 7.3%. Women have shown their strength, however, in the regional assemblies. Of the 230,000 regional assemblies, women play an active role as leaders in 76,200 of them. It cannot be said that women play a sufficient role in the decision-making processes in the governments of Asia, and this, too, is an important issue for the future. As one aspect of the empowerment of women, it is vital to incorporate this into the plan of action. Our existing laws and systems, religions and cultures have taken their present form only after a long period of development. Therefore, there are undoubtedly considerable difficulties that would be met in attempting to overturn them all at once. However, the prospects are certain to improve through steady and continued grassroots action with the purpose of creating relationships of trust between men and women based on true freedom and equality. In Sagamihara City, which is located in Kanagawa Prefecture in Japan, the citizens and the municipal government have unified their efforts in a diverse array of activities. These activities aim to seek ways of recreating the relationship between men and women. The ultimate goal is to build a regional society where men and women can comfortably coexist and mutually help one another. A variety of activities are being developed to enable men and women to work together in the nurturing of their families, in developing the region, and in creating workplaces where men and women can work together with equality. Then, hoping for a regional society that will reach out to the world, they are launching activities that would serve to strengthen the sense of solidarity with the women of Asia and the world through international exchanges and cooperation. Regardless of the country, movements are rising and expanding in all regions of the world, demanding the liberation of women and the equality of the sexes. We must create an awareness of the solidarity of women in all regions and countries and promote these activities even further. Only then will we be able to forge ahead one step at a time through repeated and persistent efforts, uniting our strength with that of the women of Asia and of the world. By first changing ourselves, men in turn will change, and then we will see changes taking place throughout the world. That is what is meant by empowerment. We women must raise our aspirations high and become a light that shines upon the earth. <laughs>